we are on a uh, very good evening everyone uh, today we are at the second session of uh, squint session and uh, it will be about physiology of extraocular muscles and its applied aspects today we have dr pradeep sharma and dr amitava chairingers and the topic is physiology of extraocular muscles and its applied aspects to, and now i'll hand over to dr pradeep sharma to introduce our speaker Uh, thank you, Asha. I think once again, I would like to uh, really thank Dr. Santosh and his team for uh, starting this I Focus online on Strabismus. Uh, I think it's a wonderful module, and we have now the second of, of the series that is going on. And uh, we had the anatomy talked about last session, and now we have Dr. Divya to talk about the physiology of extraocular muscle. She is a consultant, pediatric ophthalmologist, Strabismus, and neuro ophthalmology at the Justi. V Ramanamma Children's Eye Care Center, and she has a, a unique interest in uh, nystagmus and complex strabismus, and that's probably one of the reasons that physiology matters a lot. And I think she is going to give you an overview of physiology of the extraocular muscles, a relatively more untouched subject for most of the PGs, and it is really desirable to hear her, Dr. Divya. Please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pradeep Sharma. Uh, I thank uh, uh, Dr. Santosh Shanover and Dr. Pradeep Sharma for having me today. It's uh, it's uh, wonderful to be a part of this uh, particular program. So, um, and it's very as Dr. Pradeep Sharma said, it's uh, going to be very interesting talking about the basics of strabismus. So that way we can understand uh, various other concepts in strabismus and neuroophthalmology. I hope my slides are visible. Yes. All right. So, um, um, so we'll be talking about physiology of extraocular muscle, and um, I will be going through certain basic anatomic and histologic characteristics in this particular topic. Uh, things that will help us understand the functioning of extraocular muscles, certain physiologic and pharmacologic characteristics of extraocular muscles, and the various applied aspects. Uh, concerning these uh, this particular topic now this is a quite a vast uh, area and uh, i'll be just touching upon uh, the basics that will help us understand how how and why muscles function the way they do um all right let's start off with the anatomic and histologic characteristics um as we know um any striated muscle fiber in the body uh, that is a form uh, that's a part of the skeletal muscle system usually has two types of fibers the red fibers and the white fibers uh it is very characteristically known that red fibers have a smaller diameter they have a rich sarcoplasm they are mainly involved in slow contraction and relaxation of the muscles the the contraction and relaxation the functioning of the red fibers is of a long duration and mainly they are involved in postural activity so they form basically the muscles of the back and the larger muscles of the body uh in contrast to that the white fibers they have thicker they have a greater diameter they are medullated they have scanty sarcoplasm and they are mainly involved in quick contraction and relaxation of muscles the 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 contraction and relaxation will be of short duration most often and they are mainly involved in locomotion and quick activity so then we have to ask the question so we all know that extraocular muscles are striated muscles and is it that uh, they are just as similar as any of the striated muscles in any other part of the body uh, i'll have to tell you that they are not and let me tell you how they are different so uh, generally in any other part a striated muscle will be either characterized as red fibers or red, as white fibers what is very unique is in extraocular muscles both these systems have to function simultaneously what i mean to say is the same muscle will actually have both these kind of fibers and both these kind of functions so let us take it forward and see how it happens so there are some aspects histologic aspects of muscle fibers which are very different from other striated muscles in the body first is that muscle fibers of the eye are of varying diameters they vary from 
what is classically reported as 9 to 17 microns, but they can be very fine in, uh, it can be about almost about 3 microns in some areas and sometimes they may be up to 50 microns. Now, if you contrast this with uh, the muscle fibers of any other striated muscle, it is almost close to around 90 to 100 microns. So these are generally fine fibers, but still they are of quite varying diameters. So that is the first difference as compared to other striated muscles. Uh, characteristically, they have very good interconnection of muscle fibers. Basically, when we think of a muscle fiber starting from one end to the other, so this is to the proximal portion of the muscle, it is not the same muscle fiber that actually extends throughout. What has been known is about 44 to 72% of the muscle fibers actually are more in number at the central portion of the muscle. Towards the periphery, towards the tendinous portion, they actually become thinned out. So what it means is basically the same muscle fiber is not extending from one end to the other. On the other hand, there are interconnection of muscle fibers. Muscle fibers are distributed majorly at the center of the muscle and towards the end, they come out. But there are very good interconnection of muscle fibers and they are connected by these myomyas junctions, pollen stress positive myomyas junctions. So this um, interconnection is very important and that is very integral in the part of uh, the fine and precise movements that the extraocular muscles uh, have to perform. Um, uh, the third characteristic of extraocular muscles is usually they have very grossly, they have a peripheral orbital layer and a central bulbous layer. So the peripheral orbital layer is the one that faces the orbit and that mainly consists of thin fibers. Now, I'll again be reiterating this point later on when we talk about the different muscle fibers, but we have to remember that there's a peripheral orbital layer that faces the orbit, and then there's a central bulbous layer on the other portion of the muscle that actually is uh, just opposing the glow. These are actually thicker fibers. Uh, let's just keep this point in uh, mind so that this will come in handy later. The next important point is the, the presence of abundant elastic tissue. In fact, the extraocular muscles have such abundant uh, elastic tissue that they're actually called as elastic bands. So these are arranged parallel to the muscle fibers and then they have these transverse interconnecting fibers. And this elastic tissue is thought to be quite important for the fine regulation of eye moments. Now, how is this? actually applied in uh, in our uh, uh, what we see in the clinic so in the orbit muscles are placed along with the other uh, subcutaneous tissues now these elastic bands that are that are integral uh, to the muscle they actually have connections with the other subcutaneous tissues and they contribute towards viscoelastic movement of the orbit now that becomes important because whenever the globe moves in any direction these viscoelastic movements kind of put a stop or kind of regulate the movement of the globe. And they are integral actually when the eye has to fixate in one particular uh, gaze. So elastic tissue is abundant and this is again a characteristic of extraocular muscles. Then we come to a very important point about nerve supply. So uh, when we talk about a single muscle, uh, and then the nerve supply to that, the muscle fibers are supplied by uh, these nerves. The nerve, one nerve fiber usually supplies about 12 muscle fibers. Now, this particular ratio is actually very high. Uh, if you compare it to the rest of the body, the nerve fiber to muscle fiber ratio is close to 1 is to 125. In extraocular muscles, this ratio is much, much higher. It's just one nerve fiber will supply 12 muscle fibers. and this has a lot of applied aspects, as we will see further on. Uh, these nerves, moreover, are thick motor nerves, modulated nerves, and they are mainly responsible for the fine regulation that we have in, uh, in uh, extraocular muscles. Also, they all of them follow the all or nothing law. So I'm sure all of you know about this. It's just that once a particular stimulus, nerve stimulus is given to a muscle, that crosses the th threshold, the muscle will contract to its maximum peak and then it will come back, relax to its uh, baseline level. So once the supraluminal stimulus is given to the muscle, 
it it goes ahead and uh, has a complete contraction and relaxation so extraocular muscles follow this particular law also very characteristically there are multiple types of nerve endings in these muscles so uh, many of them many of the striated muscles they have only one or two type but but in extraocular muscles there are these three types of nerve endings seen first is the single motor end plates these are present in the coarser uh, muscle fibers the larger ones the second is multiple grape like muscle uh, nerve endings around the tendons and these actually contribute to the sensory aspect of uh, the muscle and finally you have very fine non bendulated fibers that end uh, in the thinner muscle fibers so these various types of nerve endings actually are present and that is because the nerve to muscle ratio here is very high so you 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 find all these different types of nerve endings in different types of muscles in the extraocular muscles itself so these are uh, so just a gist of all the anatomic and histologic properties uh, the nerve to muscle ratio is very high elastic forces are very important and they have a characteristic peripheral orbital layer and a central bulbous layer so having understood this let's go on to the physiologic and pharmacologic characteristics of extraocular muscles um so as we said the nerve to muscle ratio is good so they are most of them are involved in very fast contraction some of them are just take around 8 milliseconds and these very import these fast contractions are very important for uh, the saccadic eye movements now saccadic eye movements we'll describe that subsequently are in, are very fast fixating eye movements so for the movement to happen you have to have a very fast contraction of the muscles and these are uh, extraocular muscles are characteristic for that also as compared to the other striated muscles in the body muscle responses are slightly smaller in amplitude because of the obvious size of the muscle and then they are also shorter in duration so they are quicker and they are higher in frequency they go up to 150 cycles per second all these are actually different as compared to other striated muscles in the body also for their functioning they need a high oxygen supply and they receive a very high oxygen supply so um, uh, let me just go back a little into the history and uh, describe about how these different muscle fiber systems were discovered in the eye so it was kruger who had studied uh, various striated muscle fibers the anatomy and the physiology of these and he concluded that there are usually two types of fiber systems one is the fast fiber system and the other is the slow fiber system now fast fiber system they are responsible for a fast twitch response to a single stimulus they also have a very speedy relaxation the electrical activity in it can be recorded and as characteristic of these fibers repetitive stimuli will cause a tetanic contraction uh, as a uh, uh, contrast to that is the slow fiber system where he says that the the response is very slow but a single stimulus usually will not even produce a response you need repetitive stimuli to give a slow response and then there's a maintained contraction and a slow relaxation and you need repetitive stimuli that can cause a kind of uh, a phasic contraction sorry for that uh, typo there is this phasic contraction not a tetanic contraction tetanic contraction is characteristic of the fast fiber system now um if once kruger has said that there are these two different types of muscle fiber system um how is it that an ocular muscle which actually has both kind of functions it it has both the optostatic function and the optokinetic function optostatic is a postural tonicity something like a slow acting and optokinetic is a quick tetanic contraction of the muscle now how is it that a single ocular muscle can have both these functions how can a single ocular muscle perform both the slow uh, tonic uh, reaction as well as the fast uh, quick response so the answer to that is it has been found that a single ocular muscle extraocular muscle actually has distribution of the fast fiber system as well as the slow fiber system in the same muscle it's a small muscle a small myofibril and that itself has both these systems so let me again tell you about what the fast fiber system does 
So uh, the fast fiber system actually has small, well-defined myofibrils. This is a cross section of uh, 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 the, the, uh, the, the extraocular muscle, which is showing the fast fiber system. We can see these multiple arrow marks. They show the well-developed sarcoplasmic reticulum. There is abundant sarcoplasm. There is an even appearance and the well-marked M-line and a peripherally located nucleus. Now, these are the histologic characteristic of these muscles. But what is very clear is that they have a very clear punctate appearance and abundant uh, uh, and well-defined sarcoplasmic reticulum. Again, in contrast to that, if you can say this cross-section, this is a cross-section of the same muscle showing the slow fiber system. You can see there's a mass of myofibrils. It's, it's like a clumped mass. There is very scanty sarcoplasm. There, is, there are large partially fused fibers. As I said, it, it, it looks like a clump of myofibrils. There's a very poorly developed sarcoplasmic reticulum. There is no M line and there's a centrally located nucleus. Now the M line, the presence or absence of it basically characterizes a slow fiber system and a fast fiber system. The absence of it means it's a slow fiber system. And uh, this is just to show how, the comparison, how it is. Now, these are nicely, clearly defined sarcoplasmic reticulum. Here, we do not see it at all. So both these exist in the same muscle in uh, extraocular muscle. So the characteristic is slow twitch fibers are thin motor nerve. They are multiply in innervated. Now, this again is very characteristic because there are not many striated muscles in the body that are multiply innervated. Most of them are singly innervated, but this is multiply innervated and that shows how precisely the muscular and the nervous systems are interconnected here that causes the fine and precise movement. Slow twitch fibers do not cause any action potential. They form a slow sustained contraction or a tonic contraction. They respond to denervation with hypertrophy. And what is most important is in the extraocular muscles, these slow twitch fibers are mainly seen in the orbital layer. Now, if you remember, the orbital layer is towards the periphery of the muscle. Contrasted, you see it. Uh, you see that fast twitch fibers are thick motor nerve fibers. They are usually singly innervated. They have. Uh, they show an action potential which can be electrically recorded. They are in, uh, responsible for fast contraction or basic contraction. They respond to denervation with atrophy as is characteristic of any fast uh, medullating nerve fiber. And they are in the uh, muscle fiber, they are mainly in the central bulbous portion. So uh, I, I, we can again reiterate your anatomy, the peripheral orbital portion that has, that, ha that has more of the slow twitch fibers, and it is the central bulbous portion that has more of the fast twitch fibers. Now, regarding the distribution of these ocular muscle fibers, it has been noted that these um, uh, fast twitch fibers, which are present in the central area, they, they extend up to the extension of the muscle and stop at where the muscle is inserted. On the other hand, at the peripheral orbital portion of the muscles, where the slow twitch fibers are, they extend slightly beyond the muscle and kind of get integrated with the elastic tissue. And uh, therefore, and that the, there is a significance of this also, that they are kind of attached to the um, viscoelastic forces, as I said, the orbital uh, tissue and the elastic bands, as well as the subcutaneous tissue, all these will cause the viscoelastic forces of the orbit. So these slow twitch fibers kind of get integrated onto that. And here is an example of how the muscle uh, fibers respond to acetylcholine. Acetylcholine, as you all know, is a, neuro a neurotransmitter. So whenever a low dose acetylcholine, so this particular experiment was done uh, by isolating the, the peripheral orbital portion from the central bulbous portion and each was injected with a, a particular dose of acetylcholine. And if you can see the slow fiber system has this tonic contraction that is full following the all and unlawed and the contraction is lasting for more than six minutes. Whereas the fast fibers actually have a small rise in tension and they quickly return to the baseline. So this is how, uh, this is the difference in the response between um, slow fiber system and fast fiber system in, in case of uh, 
uh, extraocular muscle. So uh, we have kind of covered certain important histologic aspects, anatomic aspects of extraocular muscle, and we have also covered certain uh, uh, physiologic aspects. Uh, these are important characteristics of extraocular muscles that are different from striated muscles elsewhere in the body. And let us see now how different they are and how differently they uh, they uh, have an effect in uh, in our normal day-to-day -day activity and and how we can how we can uh, see uh, their action uh, whenever the eye moves or fixes. So before we go into uh, exactly the eye uh, physiology, uh, let me just give you a brief introduction about the different types of eye movements. So um, normally there are four different types of eye movements that are known. First is the saccadic eye movement. Then we have the smooth pursuit. Then we have the virgences and then the vestibulo ocular eye movement. So all these are, they have different characteristics. So the first one is saccades. Now saccades are rapid, abrupt eye movements. It is when, when the eye has to fixate on a peripheral object and the eye just moves from one point to another. The saccadic eye movement is the most important when somebody has to fixate on one object suddenly that they can be voluntary, they can be involuntary. They are the, so that the, what happens here is somewhere in the peripheral retina, there comes a stimulus that, that there is a target. So in order to view the target, uh, the signal goes back to the brain that the eye muscle has to move from where it is present, say in the primary position, to that peripheral retinal position. So the difference, the difference between the primary position and that peripheral retinal position is known as the motor error. So that much is the is the is the movement that the eye muscle has to make in order to fixate the eye onto the target. So that is the saccadic command that comes. Now the the, the signal from the brain comes and reaches the extraocular muscle, and then the muscle makes that particular movement. There are two important aspects over here. It is known as a ballistic movement. Characteristic, characteristically, it's defined as a ballistic movement. Now, what this means is once a, a command has reached the muscle from the brain that the movement has to be from one position to the other, the muscle moves exactly to that extent and not a little below or a little above that particular there is no, once the command reaches the muscle, the muscle cannot change. It has to go and, and perform that complete movement up till where it is. So the, 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 the neural integration has to be very precise in this particular condition. So saccadic eye movements are very quick, abrupt, and they just reach the target exactly. Um, as I said, you cannot, we cannot change. So involuntarily, it is actually programmed as a primary and a secondary saccade. What happens is the primary saccade, the eye, the movement, the extraocular muscle gets a signal to uh, reach, just, reach the point just slightly before the target. And then the secondary saccade acts to just refixate it to exactly the target. So this is just an uh, uh, side, but main thing is that a saccadic uh, eye movement fixates the object onto a peripheral target point. The second type of eye movement is smooth pursuit eye movement in which there are, these are slow tracking eye movements. So when we want to move the eye from one position to the other and slowly follow a moving target. So that's when the eye makes a smooth pursuit eye movement. Now these uh, movements are voluntary eye movements and uh, they are essential for uh, tracking an object or uh, following a moving object. Now uh, we Usually we have a horizontal and a vertical saccades or smooth pursuits. And whenever the eye moves, uh, eyes move in tandem, like whenever there are versions that are being uh, performed, then both saccades and smooth pursuits are a part of this particular eye movement. Uh, the third type of eye movements are virgences. Now virgences are disconjugate eye movements. So what does this particular term mean? Disconjugate means that each eye moves in a different direction. Conjugate is both eyes move in the same direction. So, virgences here are of two types convergence or divergence. And if you know, 
if one eye is moving towards the center so moving towards the left the other eye will move towards the right in case of convergence and vice versa in case of divergence so this is known as a disconjugate uh, eye movement and the main purpose of this is whenever an object is at different distances from the eye the these uh, these movements generally align the fovea to that particular target so they we always need a certain amount of convergence and a certain amount of divergence uh, in order to fixate a target at the fovea a target which is at different distance and finally we have the vestibulo ocular eye movement now these are very important eye movements because they stabilize the eye relative to the external world so let me just uh, give an example about how it works what basically happens is when we fixate uh, on a particular object and if the eyes do not move but the head moves then if the eye also moves along with the head then then there won't be any then it will cause a lot of confusion the uh, targets will keep moving and the eye cannot fixate on each one it will cause a lot of confusion so there this particular reflex has 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 been developed which is known as vestibulo ocular reflex where if an eye is fixating at an object even if we move the head slightly the eye continues to fixate on that particular object so the basically the the, the inner ear is involved in this when it, when there is stimulus to move the head on one side there is stimulus for the extraocular muscles to move on to the other side the contralateral to the head movement so that the eye remains fixated on to the target so these are uh, the four different types of eye movements that happen in anything let's now see how the muscles actually uh, are involved in these type of eye movements so as i said versions where both uh, saccade and smooth bursts are involved and versions which is a different type of eye movement so generally versions are very fast eye movements velocity is almost about 30 to 700 degree per second so as i said saccadic eye movements are very fast quick eye movements the eye has to quickly fixate from one to the second point so their velocity is very high they have a latency of 20 milliseconds latency wise versions as well as vergences are almost the same here in version versions what happens is there is fast acceleration to a maximum velocity and then there's a gradual deceleration as i said again primary and secondary saccades play a role so in performing versions we have both uh, saccades as well as smooth bursts and uh, how are the eye muscles what are the kind of muscles that are involved in saccades and smooth bursts so um, basically what happens is whenever there's a saccadic eye movement it is known as both the fast as well as the slow fibers are involved and whenever there is a smooth bursts usually it's actually a combination but more of the slow fibers are involved so versions basically employs both these muscle fibers in this particular uh, way similarly uh, versions which are different types of eye movements you have a velocity of only about 20 degrees so they are slow movements they cannot perform convergence and divergence with the same velocity as we perform saccades so they are much slower eye movement latency is almost same there's a gradual acceleration and a gradual deceleration and here there is a difference even amongst these even amongst divergences there are slightly faster fusional divergences and slightly slower fusional divergences so as i said uh, now versions and divergences are performed by the same ocular muscles for example if we want to look towards the right then the right lateral rectus moves and then the left medial rectus moves if on the other hand i want to look at an object that is very close to me both my medial recti perform a vergens movement so medial rectus can perform both version as well as vergences now how is it that the same ocular muscles can perform both actions so again as i had said so the fast fibers which are present in the central bulbous portion of the muscle they are usually active only in the maximum field of action of the muscle they are inactive outside the field of action of the muscle so there's a gradual acceleration when the eye reaches the, the muscle reaches the maximum field of action the fast fibers act and they reach a maximum contraction again when they are at the extreme of case fast fibers cease to act in contrast 
low fibers which are present peripherally they are active even in extreme positions of gaze now they are peripherally located they are at the orbital portion of the muscle and as i said they kind of integrate with the orbital uh, uh, elastic muscles so even in the extreme position of gaze these low fibers are acting and their activity increases as the eyes fixate more in the field of action so in the extreme positions of gaze when the eye is constantly fixating on one particular target that is when these low fibers are more active when the eye has to move from one to another target and quickly uh, perform the action that's when fast fibers are more involved but then again in any saccade both fast fibers and slow fibers are involved and in a smooth pursuit it is more often the slow fibers that are involved uh so this just reiterates the same point so slow fibers are involved more in optostatic function in fixating an eye to a particular object or in in maintaining a particular eccentric or primary gaze and optokinetic function involves both fast and slow fibers to per perform that quick version movement that is involved um finally um uh, we will be uh, talking briefly about fixation of eye movement so we spoke about how the eye moves from one point to the other using saccades or smooth pursuits how do the eye what are the factors that are involved in fixation of eye movements to one particular target so or in one particular gaze so for fixation of eye movements in one particular gaze there are three factors that are involved first is the pursuit system the smooth pursuits second is the vestibular system and third is the neural integrator and all these are actually involved in are all these are kind of present in the same extraocular muscle so uh, the pursuit system or smooth pursuit system will have a particular feedback which will make the muscle rest on that particular target and then the slow muscle fibers will keep it in that particular state maintaining that tonic activity the vestibular system as i said the they will maintain the eye in that particular on, on that particular target even if there is an external environmental change or whether, even if there is a change in the position of the head so that's where the vestibular system acts and the vestibular ocular reflexes play a role finally there is the neural integrator so uh, th there is a feedback that is uh, uh, that is given from the muscle to the uh, to the supranuclear control and that is uh, and the and from there uh, in the abducens nuclei there is in the midbrain from there the 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 uh, there is um, a signal coming on to the eye to the viscoelastic forces to maintain the eye in that particular gaze okay. so these are the different eye movements uh, uh, these are the different components that are involved in fixation of eye movements and maintaining the eye in one particular gaze. um as i was talking about uh, the feedback so we we uh, there are supranuclear control or uh, that that uh, that gives signals to the eye muscles to move whether it is for a saccade or a smooth pursuit or vertices or vestibular ocular so what about the feedback from the muscle to the brain so the it has not been exactly known what what exact anatomic structure actually gives the feedback but it is it is mostly speculated that muscle spindles the fine cross striated fibers with their capsule those are the the area those are the proprioceptive sensory organs in the muscle there have been some studies which said that the palisade endings of the muscles right at the tendon no those are the proprioceptive uh, sensory organs they give a feedback back to the brain about whether the muscle or the or about the position of the eye and the position of the muscle this has uh, the feedback on eye position has a big role to play in nystagmus uh, where uh, if if this particular uh, this is uh, this uh, um, um, feedback is very active in case of nystagmus and and therefore when we do a tenotomy or a tenectomy in case of a nystagmus where we we kind of remove the palisade endings or the tendinous endings then the feedback that goes back to the brain and to cause the nystagmoid movements reduces and therefore the the frequency of the movements is known to come down post surgery so this is this is the 
uh, the basis behind that. And finally, we'll be talking about, uh, uh, we have been talking about muscle and muscle activity. Uh, the most important applied aspect of extraocular muscles is in myo electromyography. So we know that electromyography is oscilloscopic recording of electrical activities of a muscle. So in this particular uh, uh, test, electrodes are inserted into the muscle in the extracellular space. And, um, and this basically records the, the, the stimulus that is coming from the cell, the cell body of the neuron to the axon of the neuron to the muscle fiber. This is known as the anatomic motor unit. And then it transforms in, into the electrical motor unit from where the this electrical stimulus comes and, and we can record it as the movement of the muscle. So whenever there is any twitch or any movement, any saccade, any smooth pursuit, any kind of eye movement, that particular uh, movement is recorded in, in terms of uh, electro, recorded uh, as an electrical motor unit and we see it in the form of an electromyography. Now, electromyography is used in multiple places in strabismus whenever we are assessing any paretic uh, muscle in, in pseudoparetic as in any restrictive conditions in the various types of myopathies in uh, Duane's retraction syndrome. So in Duane's retraction syndrome, the etiology of the, the, the pathogenesis of the condition, the pathology of the condition was actually properly understood only after electromyography where the lateral rectus, medial rectus, the, the, the uh, muscle uh, contraction and relaxation, the relaxation of these muscles actually proved about the, uh, the particular uh, condition, the particular retraction syndrome. Similarly, electromyography helps us differentiate a paralytic uh, condition from a restrictive condition. Very characteristically, it is used in ocular myasthenia crevice where we see very characteristic muscle response in electromyography. Um, so whenever an eye is, uh, this is probably the last part of the presentation. It's just about the, I, as I said, muscle actively moves and therefore performs, but there is sometimes the muscle is still performing the opto uh, static function. So at that time, what is the mechanism that contributes to the tone of these muscles? So either it is moving, whether it is uh, static, what, what are the different uh, uh, stimuli to keep, to keep the muscle in that particular state? So there are various stimuli. The most important comes from the central nervous system. Central nervous system is uh, actually will want to upkeep any of the stimuli that's coming from sensory sources. So the eye muscles always have to be in position. They always have to be on guard, getting the, the because the eye is one of the most important sensory organs. So the stimuli has to come from there and the eye muscles always have to be kind of on guard. So one of the most important factors keeping the eye muscles on guard is the central nervous system. Second is light. Basically light is, from, is the most important stimulus to uh, the eye. So that is again an important uh, a mechanism that contributes to the tone of the muscle. Third is about the neck muscles. So neck muscles basically position the eye in the head and that the reflex tone from the neck, neck muscles actually contribute to the eye, uh, eye muscle position and the tone of the extraocular muscle. Uh, as we spoke about vestibular stimulations causing the vestibular ocular reflexes. So that's again an important stimulus towards uh, maintaining the tone of eye muscles. And what is very now recently uh, known, but the most important contributing factor is the psycho-optical reflexes. So the optical characteristics, so the eye focusing, so that basically keeps the eye in focus. So this, these are the important mechanisms that contribute towards maintaining the tone of the muscle in, uh, in the eye. Uh, so the take-home points from this presentation are that extraocular muscles are very unique in their structure and their function as compared to other striated muscles of the body, mainly because both the slow and fast twitch fibers are involved and they are present in the same striated muscle. The, the, there are various uh, very important unique points to each of these uh, extraocular muscles, most important being the the nerve to muscle ratio, which is very, very good. 
there has to be very good integration there is very good integration between the muscle and nervous system and these are finally going to be most important in the precise eye movements that the extraocular muscles are responsible for uh, these are my references uh, thank you And thank yeah christy are you going to so i think it was a wonderful talk by dr divya on the extraocular muscles physiology and the types of eye movements i think it's a very interesting thing that we should know so that... i think you are muted we can't hear you uh, i think i could i can hear you dr shah i am not muted i think yeah, i i can we can hear you yeah so what i was saying is that eye muscles are unique they are the probably the only striated muscles which are always working they are never at rest even during when we are sleeping there is the rem phase the rapid eye mo movement phase when the eye movements are still working so other than eye muscles it's only the cardiac muscle which may not be considered as striated muscles because they are striated but involuntary so the eye muscles that we are uh, unique they are never uh, at rest so that is why i think they have uh, very specific things which dr divya was talking about it's like a runner uh, could be a fast runner who would take a sprint of 100 meters and another runner who is a marathon runner runs for uh, miles together both have different characteristics but in the eye muscle we have a combination of both to subserve both the functions and i think uh, the older classification of fibrillin structure and uh, felder structure was talking about it but generally it is in the same muscle as dr divya was saying nowadays we know that the same functions are available in each muscle and the more extensive studies have shown that they have an orbital and the global uh, separation there are two compartments of the each uh, uh, extraocular muscle and in that too there are further uh, uh, divisions on the basis of whether they are singly innervated or multiply innervated like in orbital 80% of the orbital is uh, osif that is singly innervated fibers whereas in the orbital 20% are multiply innervated and the global ones have further subdivisions there are the red fibers the intermediate fibers and the white fibers which give us all this unique combination of function now we as we said we wanted a marathon runner combined with a fast runner both so eyes are really required we want a very quick glance at times and then we want a sustained uh, function also so these two functions are being given very nicely and then she also talked about the types of eye movements and you see such an interesting thing i think we are inheriting from uh, i think the nature that we have a very fast eye movement probably is the fastest uh, eye uh, movement which can be possible it will be like 600 to 800 degrees per second so that is the type of uh, fastness in the saccadic eye movement uh, and the unique thing during saccadic eye movement is uh, uh, also to re remember that there is a saccadic suppression that means we do not see the visualization is suppressed during a saccad otherwise it would be very disturbing when we are looking at a sudden movement from uh, Im imagine you would have oscillopsia it would be very disturbing so we do have a saccadic suppression during a saccad you don't see what has happened in between you only see the uh, starting point and then the end point so this is no fixation eye movement whereas the other type of movement the pursuit the slow movements you have a continuous visualization through even the uh, innervational mechanisms are different for a saccade uh, there is a pulse which is required in the innervation which is a sudden uh, rise in the innervation and that will give you that jump to move and then to sustain that movement there is a step and as dr divya was saying there is a neural integrator in the uh, midbrain the pprf itself there are certain neurons which are functioning functioning to give you the pulse the burst cells and the pause cells which are giving the eye movements and then there are the neural integrator cells which will give you which will convert this pulse into a sustained movement to maintain the eye in that position so the pulse step and some conditions of eye movement disorders we have a pulse step imbalance so we have overshoot uh, over saccades or uh, we have type of nystagmus in which the eye movement does not sustain and it slips and then there is another fast component required again it slips so that's why we have that 
uh, the nystagmus, the jerk nystagmus, in which the problem, as we know, is the slow component in which the sustenance is not possible. So those are the things which we have uh, in the system. And even in the muscles, there is a little difference for, as we talked about the fast and the slow components, even in the innervational system, we have the pulse step. For the pursuit, we have to have a ramp. The innervation is slowly rising through, which gives us this uh, slow pursuit eye movements. Uh, the types of eye movements she did talk about as four types. I think we also have a fifth type we usually talked about, that is the uh, position maintenance system. Apart from the saccades, the pursuits, the vestibular and the virgin sign movements, a fifth one is usually talked about that's the position maintenance system. And what are the features of that is that we have very fine glycades and micro saccades, which are giving us this fixation. If we have a disturbance of this uh, system, we will have again a type of nystagmus. We will not be able to look at a, a person. Uh, if you all know the physiology of eye movements, we have something known as a, uh, the adaptation of the cones because it's the cones will fire and then they will be bleached. So you won't be able to see. If there was no position maintenance system, you would be blinded in a few seconds because there would be a bleaching of the cones of that particular foveal area. So you won't be able to see after a few seconds. So what nature has given is that you have a glycade, a smooth, slight movement of a few microseconds um, degree. And that would again re-fixate to give us the uh, thing so that we can overcome this problem of what is the bleaching effect. So again, the micro system, micro uh, system to give us the position maintenance is very important. The troxlers phenomenon, I mean, many of you would recall there is something that's known as the troxlers phenomenon. The cones get bleached. And so we have these micro saccades to overcome that. So I think she did talk about very uh, uh, interesting points. If there are any questions, we would like to have. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Christy, could you take the questions? Because I think Asha Ma'am's uh, uh, audio is not clear. Uh, is it not clear? No, ma'am, your voice is breaking. Okay. Yeah, your voice is breaking. Okay, I'll proceed with the qu first question uh, till Asha Ma'am's uh, uh, audio comes back. Uh, the first question is that what explains pendular nystagmus versus jerk nystagmus? Pathologically, the slow component assumes importance. What contributes to the phenomena of uh, varied presentations like the seesaw nystagmus? Divya ma'am, would you like to take that question? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I mean, yeah, so uh, basically it just depends on, so nystagmus happens whenever there is a uh, disparity in the fixation of the eye movement. So uh, there is something, some, uh, something that is happening in the pursuit system or in the neural integrator uh, or in the vestibular ocular reflex. So whenever there is a, there is a, uh, a break or a leaky, what is cl classically known as a leaky neural integrator, there may be a different type of nystagmus. Now, these are uh, just different types of nystagmus and they, they present differently. So, um, so then they can present as a uh, jerky nystagmus, they can present as a pendular, they can present as a multiplanar nystagmus, sometimes a torsional. So it depends on what muscles are involved and what is the type of uh, the the integrator system that is going wrong that results in this uh, this kind of uh, 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 abnormal eye movement. Yeah. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, is my uh, voice audible now? Yes, ma'am. Perfect. Please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, ma'am, the next question is: In cases of nerve injury, does it follow Valerian region regeneration like peripheral neuromuscular physiology? I think this question has been asked by someone very intelligent. Uh, yes, as far as I know, it does. Because as I was telling, to denervation, both the slow and the fast muscle fibers actually have a reaction. So the fast muscle fibers undergo atrophy and the slow muscle fibers undergo hypertrophy. So it, it follows the same principle as that of striated uh, muscles, as far as I know. 
Yeah. Do any? Does anyone want to add, sir, Dr. Pradeep Sharma or Dr. Amitavai? Do you want to add anything to this question, sir? I think Professor Pradeep Sharma wanted to say something. No, that's right. I think Valerian degeneration, as I think Dr. Divya was saying, that it's similar in the nerves. That means in the third, fourth, and sixth nerve, when we are talking, it's uh, different. But in optic nerve, which is really not a nerve, it is an actually a uh, uh, tract. It's a, a continuation of the uh, white matter of the brain. So it's not actually a nerve. So that way, the degeneration, Valerian degeneration doesn't apply to the optic nerve. But for the third, fourth, and uh, the sixth nerves, that extraocular muscle nerves, there the same sort of thing is there. So I think that should be uh, remembered. That's why we know that there is no regeneration of the optic nerve. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, uh, for adding that up. Uh, can you please explain the concept of arc of contact of extraocular muscles? Uh, Dr. Divya, do you want to take the question? Um, yes. Uh, so arc of contact, actually, uh, that will probably be uh, a different topic by itself because we'll then have to understand about how the muscle functions and how each and uh, about the, the course of the muscle along the globe, about where it is inserted at the limbus, and where uh, and at what what is the equatorial point so these are all important aspects if we have to understand the arc of contact of the muscle so as long as it is closely uh, following the globe the action of the muscle is good up uh, beyond one point be beyond what is known as the equatorial point what happens is the muscle and the globe the the attachment the closeness actually comes down so then the effect of the muscle is also lost. So this is what or, or comes down. So this is what happens whenever a muscle is normally inserted at the spiral of the law, each muscle is inserted at one particular point. So there is one particular portion of the muscle that is very closely opposed to the globe and therefore that causes that particular action of the muscle and it is all in tandem. What happens when we say recess a muscle? Suppose we recess the lateral rectus to a point that is uh, seven or eight millimeter from the insertion, then the, the particular arc of contact is still maintained and the muscle is just weakened, but it is still functioning and it can still perform that particular action. But if we recess, say, the lateral rectus to a point that is 12 millimeter from its insertion, what happens is now the arc of contact actually comes down. So the 12 millimeter recession will not cause the ideal 12 millimeter effect of recession, in fact, it will just cause probably a 9 millimeter effect of the session because that is the equatorial point. And beyond that, the 3 millimeter actually loses its, uh, its effectivity. So this is why we say that each muscle has one particular amount of recession or resection that is actually going to provide maximum effect. I think this uh, will be better understood if whenever we talk about the arc of the, the other physio physiology of eye movement. Uh, but this in brief is what is the concept about arc of no, basically what you need to understand is whenever a muscle contracts in this we have to go back to our physics sometimes we wonder why med in medicine we were taught physics uh, I think all of you should recollect what is force and what is torque are you aware a force is basically a force that means a power generated in a linear action whereas a torque is applied to a round structure what, how much is the rotation which is possible by that contraction of the muscle? Now, when the muscle is attached somewhere, when it contracts linearly, the muscle is always going to contract linearly. But if there is an arc of contact, it unfurls the globe. That gives you the rotational force. Okay. So, if you want a rotational action, which we actually want whenever we are having eye movements, we have to have an arc of contact on which we will be able to work. To work. If suppose you reach to the final uh, point of functional equator, whatever contraction will happen, it will never cause a torque. It will never cause a rotational force. It will only cause a retractional force. So if you attach a muscle behind the functional equator, it will act as a retractor. It will not act as a torque, as a rotational muscle. So then if you are going to, let's say, uh, medial rectus is attached uh, beyond 6 millimeters, then whatever contraction of medial rectus is there, it will only cause a retraction. It won't be able to give a rotational force, which is only possible as long as it is in the arc of contact. For the lateral rectus, this is much larger because the muscle is coming 
and the attachment of the muscle uh, underneath the globe is going to be much larger about 12 to 18 millimeters so that's why you can have a much larger recession of the lateral rectus so i think if this is point is clear that we are talking about force versus torque so whenever we do a faden or a posterior fixation we are basically giving a new insertion to that muscle so now whatever force is going to act is at that new point which is much more posterior if it goes behind behind the functional equator it will not be able to have a torque or a rotational force only force will be retractory force so that's why the muscle becomes weak as a totter as a rotator thank you sir for such wonderful explanation sir how does hang back uh, act then if we take this arc of contact in consideration okay so if you are having a hang back recession you are basically going to have the attachment of the muscle at that new point unless you are having non absorbable sutures and the eye is allowed to move otherwise it will be attaching the muscle so whenever we are doing a supra maximal recession since we cannot reach that uh, posterior point we are having a sort of hemi hang back mostly let's say if you want to do an 18 mm of lateral rectus recession you do not have the ability to go at uh, the uh, the muscle at 18 mm you may put it 12 mm with 6 mm hang back but the muscle will finally attach at the sclera at 18 mm once the 60 vicle gets absorbed but there is a possibility of creeping forward so that is why the applied aspect is that never have a hang back more than 6 or 7 mm because you will will not get a predictable uh, recession the muscle pseudo tendon may uh, contract and there will be creeping forward okay thank you sir and uh, the next question is what should be kept in mind to avoid oculo cardiac reflex while performing strabismus surgery so i think oculo cardiac reflex is uh, there because the vagus nerve is always attached and this is one of the areas where we have it so whenever you have a stretch it will cause a vagal uh, attachment and so the ocr happens that means the cardiac uh, bradycardia will happen in order to prevent this it will be rarely seen in a peribulbar block or a retrobulbar injection block because we have anesthetized that it happens under general anesthesia because that pathway is still intact you know only cause a general anesthesia so that's why ocrs are happening during ga and not under uh, retrobulbar injection or peribulbar injection because you have anesthetized that arc the afferent pathway okay so if you want to prevent that you need to give a block so many times your anesthetist might tell you that give a, uh, even under ga you can uh, give a subtenance uh, xylocaine anesthesia to prevent this otherwise you have to use glycopyrrolate or atropine to uh, uh, take care of the bradycardia so that is then acting at the efferent point at the afferent point if you want to act you can anesthetize the eye yeah thank you sir uh, sir uh, next question is to dr amitava in tdd what could possibly explain the differential extent and time of involvement of uh, recti muscles sorry i best the mr beginning please yeah in tdd in thyroid eye disease what could okay. possibly explain the differential extent and time of involvement of recti muscles uh time of involvement i really uh, wouldn't know that i think i would uh, leave it to professor sharma to take over i am not very sure of that uh, you know i i don't have the answer to that i i also don't know if there is any specific thing which uh, causes the uh, rule of uh, inferior rectus middle rectus superior rectus lateral rectus being involved in that particular fashion uh, maybe dr santosh knows something more we can ask dr santosh if he's there uh in oculoplasty doctor sanya so would you want me to repeat yeah. no no i i got the question it is to do with the receptors the number of receptors that are there anti thyroid receptor antibodies to bind so it is something to do with the number of receptors that is what is vaguely understood otherwise there is no reason thank you so i think this question might have been asked by extremely intelligent residents <laughs> so uh, this is the last question for today's session can you please explain the uh, bells phenomenon the guy would like to uh divya ma'am are you online yes. 
Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the question is regarding uh, explanation of Bell's phenomenon. Uh, okay. Uh, and uh, in context of the eye movement. Yes, ma'am. Like what muzzle acts and the bells and how the, how exactly is the mechanism? Um. Uh, can anybody else fix this? I... Yeah, I think it's a protective reflex mechanism. That whenever the eyes are uh, closing, the, whenever the uh, there is an orbicularis action, there is an innovation which comes to the superior rectus to uh, let the eyeball roll. So it's a protective reflex to keep the cornea and the eye safe. So I think this is something which is very important for the oculoplasty surgeon whenever he wants to do a ptosis surgery. He wants the Bell's phenomenon to be good. Otherwise, he cannot venture into doing a ptosis surgery, which will cause a lag of thalmus or a um, exposure keratopathy otherwise. Uh, Asha, this is a, a very interesting question. And I, uh, you know, in my younger days, I also tried to look and find out where exactly is the loop, where is the afferent going from, and where is the afferent coming down. And it's not very clear. I mean, even if you look up these books of Walsh and Hoy, which try their best to explain, uh, it's still not very clear. So it's best to understand it as a protective mechanism. And, you know, the, the lid, uh, lid comes down and the eyes go up. Yeah, because then we also have an inverse uh, belt. I mean, there are times when, when the eye, eye goes down. So that becomes even more uh, problematic to explain how that happens then. Dr. Santosh, do you want to add anything in this question? So, when, when it was Bells who described it. And when he described it, he said the sixth nerve was, uh, facial nerve is the one which is uh, afferent mm -hmm. and oculomotor nerve supplying the superior rectus is the afferent. That is how it was described. Of course, there are aberrations of uh, perverse bells, inverse bells, reverse bells. All that is there. But then uh, classic bells, when the eyeball rolls supratemporally, that is because of uh, this. So I hope the, uh, we have got a, not a very clear, but yeah, uh, detailed enough explanation of bells. So with this, I would like to conclude the session. First of all, I would like to thank the speaker, Dr. Divya, for delivering such a wonderful uh, uh, lecture. And I would like to thank our chairs, uh, Dr. Pradeep Sharma and Dr. Ramitava and Dr. Santosh for giving your valuable inputs uh, in our squint session today. And also Dr. Rolika and also the audience who have put up such an interesting questions today. So we will be meeting you on the next uh, Friday for the next session. And uh, that session would be on the loss of ocular motility. So that will be by Dr. Sampada Kulkarni. So see you all in next session. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye. Good night. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Have a very good day.